Wait a second. The DGPD listened to the people? Whoa. What's up, Disgenerates? It's the Disc Golf World, recapping everything disc golf you may have missed from over the weekend. I'm Jefferson. Alongside me, as always, the one with all the holes in his game, Swiss Cheese. Before we get into the recap, we gotta talk about some big news the Disc Golf Pro Tour just dropped. Heading into the Music City Open, they will be testing out the new standard tee pads for 2025. The X-Step Pro Turf tee pads are marketed as the world's finest tee pad solution. And before you ask, yes, they've already been tested. At the 2022 Portland Open too, so not some local beats here. As well as the MCO test event to ensure positive feedback before the best in the world play on them. The idea is to bring these turf tee pads to temporary courses so we don't have to make videos complaining about having no standards anymore. If we're being honest, this was always going to happen with time. I'm just glad we have some insight for the plans of the future. Feels good not to be in the dark for once. From the looks, it's promising too. But this Wednesday, we'll have a video talking to pros directly about their feelings. So make sure to subscribe to not miss out on that one. I'm glad the DGPT made the decision to standardize T-pads first, as that affects players' safety more so than anything else, so it deserves the most attention. That being said, it's time to move on to the baskets. I'm tired of seeing all these spitouts, or I've just spent too much time around veterans. Comment below what you want to see the DGPT standardize first, and it better not be the size of beer at the event. Although, if someone could point that person out, I would like to have some words. The other topic that's been circling disc golf social media is the immediate trophy presentation after the final putt. Brody Smith wasted no time to jump all over that one, nearly as fast as the immediate trophy presentation after the final putt. I understand the rule just changed, but only posting this about the FPO with the ending it had and no post after the MPO battle really feels like complaining just to complain, and that's coming from me. This being the sixth Pro Tour event I've been at this year, Hopefully I can shed a perspective better than the dudes posting from their couches for you. I know we want to make sure the scores are absolutely correct before submitting, but come on, at this point you have 6 people with phones doing the scorecard on the app that alerts if there's any mistakes. Plus all the guys behind the scenes making sure everything is correct. Now you tell me what you'd rather have, a pumped up crowd cheering on the winner while their name is being called out, or wait the 5 minutes and have no one there for the trophy since everyone already ran to get in the autograph line. Seriously, you should see how fast fans scurry to that tent. They don't care to see the winner hold up some plaque. I mean, they just watch the craziness that led up to the win anyways. Do you really think they give a shit about this part instead of getting their $30 disc sign that will never be thrown? And for the players celebrating the win, yes, for a first-time winner or even someone with passion, let them go nuts. There is no reason to ever cut a player short of their celebration. However, in the case of multiple-time winners, they don't really need any time. When was the last time you saw Tatar up in arms about a win that wasn't a major title? And she barely does it then anymore. Half the players are too scared to give a post-round interview anyways. I would rather them force to do it immediately to get the raw emotion rather than them stumbling over their own words. Or the 15 times they'll say they don't know how to feel. I've been editing the press conferences for a month now. I'm starting to see the patterns. Maybe I just don't get the awkwardness of it from being there in person. Of course I'm biased and wanting to see a rowdy crowd cheering on a winner instead of all the middle-aged men standing in line waiting for Tatar. Sorry, you guys just make it way too easy on me. The DGPT needs standards. I get that. But with the giant leaps, they've been making moves in the right direction. Now just let Own shotgun a beer next time she wins, and we'll be set. On that note, Swiss, hit them with the FPO recap. Just how hilarious was DGN's efforts to try to paint this final round of the FPO as a possible race between Kristen Tatar and Holland Hanley, highlighting Holland's six-stroke comeback against Tatar at last year's Throw Pink, win that might have been the most controversial of all last year. Shit, you got people who still hate on that win. I know that they have to keep the storyline interesting, but I hope most of you disgenerates use the morning to get a round in instead because another Tatar dominating victory that was pretty similar to the rest that have seemed to be on repeat for a better part of a year and a half now. Tatar quickly shut down any thoughts of being upset on the day. By the end of the front half, the victory was already set, as Tatar was able to sleepwalk on the back half for another Jonesboro victory. She came out with a birdie on hole one, and even though she would three-putt on hole three for a bogey, would go on a four-hole birdie stretch right after to expand her lead and was as good of a knockout shot as that Holloway KO. Once the front half was complete, Tatar's lead was only a paltry 12 strokes over Evelina Salonen. Tatar would shoot even for the back half and a relatively easy victory leading wire to wire yet again. 
Along with the victory was the elimination of any thought that her recent injuries would be an ongoing issue for the remainder of the season, as this was the healthiest we have seen Tatar thus far this season, which only resulted in her second victory this year and the largest margin on the season in the FPO. When looking at Tatar's stats, this performance doesn't seem to come to a likely end. She led the entire field in every stat off the tee, while also leading on the putting green. With Champions Cup two weeks away, Tatar is looking like she is playing her best golf of the season. Those wondering exactly where Holland Hanley went? Well, to be brutally honest, it was backwards, as she put together a four-over front half, didn't score a single birdie on the front, and went from looking like a near lock for a podium finish to competing for a second or third place spot on the back half with Evelina Salonen. Evelina would be the only one on lead card to keep pace with Tatar going three under on the front nine while adding two more birdies on 10 and 11. But a three-hole par stretch allowed Hanley to jumpstart her round and though she was out of contention for the win, challenged for a second place finish. Holland started the back half with a birdie and would go four down through the first six holes on the back, including a huge circle edge putt on 15 after Evelina was parked for a birdie. The effort cut Evelina's lead down to a single stroke in that span. On 17, both Hanley and Evelina would be looking at birdie putts, with Sullen in first to act. The putt was good enough to stay in, but these veteran baskets blow harder than Emporia wins, and the spit out would be costly, heading into the final hole now tied. Hanley cleared the OB, but wasn't in position for birdie, and Evelina did what she is supposed to. She ran the drive, only to fall just short and land OB, giving her a third place finish. Hanley's climb to second place was the best finish of the season for her, but the only consistency she has seen at most tournaments is her lack of inconsistency from round to round. The day also saw some other players seeing their best finishes on the year. Maria Oliva used a solid third round to slide into a podium just last week at an eight tier in Persimmon Ridge and looked to do the same today with an insane back half of her round. Scored seven birdies out of the first eight holes on the back half, heading into 18, needing a birdie and some help to get to the podium, but came up just short on the approach that resulted in a bogey on 18. Oliva moved 10 positions with a 6-under and her best finish at an elite event this year. Beth at 69. I just told myself, you've got to will this one in there. Whatever you have, just will it in there. This man, unbelievable. This is what athletes live for. This is the moment. When Tatar gets two wins on the season, we call it dominating. So when Anthony DeBrella wins his third, what do we call that? AB would complete his wire-to-wire -wire victory after a slow start on the windy day. He would par the first four holes, not getting his first birdie until hole five. He would find himself just outside the circle on six, but after a bad roll, he would be farther back than his original putt. Missed that one for a birdogie. Thankfully, AB picked up a recovery birdie after a smash of a drive on seven. I'm guessing he was letting some of that anger out. This was also the point Cupcake made his way to his caddy job. Who would have thought Cupcake would be late? That's okay though, because on his way to AB, he dabbed me up and said, watch this shit. Not sure what I was supposed to watch as AB would par the next four holes. Then on hole 12, would put himself in position to birdie. Only to two putt from C1X for his second birdogie of the round. Just with those two holes alone, gave up four strokes on the field. Remember that as we go down the leaderboard. Also, according to Barella, this was the point he counted himself out of contention. Followed up with a birdie, then after a prime drive on 14, would go big, putting himself deep in C2 for an eagle opportunity. He told Cupcake if he could nail that putt, the momentum would be on his side. He would go on to smash the 60-footer, giving him the second win he needed for the round, as he would go on to put his drive in C1X the next four holes, all for easy birdie looks. Although, he would just lay it up on 18 and tap in his third win on tour this season. Oh yeah, and his career. You people better not go forgetting that as breakout player is surely already locked up. Finishing his round at 6 under and right where he started, at the top of the leaderboard. The last person to win 3 out of the first 5 events was Paul Macbeth in 2019. Not sure if you COVID disc golfers know about Mr. Macbeth back then, but it's not this barely cashing stuff he's doing now. I know it's early, but I'm having a harder and harder time defending McBeast to people like this. But no one will ever be able to take away from what he's done, so remember when you do your shit talking? to do it with respect, because even in 2019, I would consider a mid based on his performances, but you can't hate on a double major season, and AB is only a couple weeks away from claiming his first, then we'll see if he can keep it up from there. I mean, he is the first back-to-back -to -back tour winner since Simon in 2022, and as a wise man once said, yeah, I can never quit, yeah, I can never quit. 
And this is the dude that also said, I could take your little bitch if I want. Yeah, but I doesn't. Kind of hard to argue with that. Calvin Heiberg came into the final round down by a stroke, but after the first hole, would take a share of the lead. He missed a C1X putt on hole two, but would snag three other birdies going into the back half four under and with the lead. Unfortunately, he would find his first bit of trouble for the round on hole 10. After an early release, Calvin found himself in a pretty horrible position. The scramble didn't help all that much, and honestly, it never really got better, taking a double bogey that would diminish the lead he had created. He would do his best to recover, getting the pick-me-up birdie on 11, then would go for a turkey trot on holes 13, 14, and 15. Calvin found himself staring down a makeable circle to look. Now, I'm not saying not throwing a forehand caused this mishap. However, after watching AB throw a soft zone skip approach, the super sky shots from both Lazad and Heimberg looked pretty dumb, like putting with a Berg dumb. He would go on to miss that putt off the band, as he would only convert on one of his six attempts from C2 and smashed all but one of his C1X putts. That would come to bite him in the end. Calvin and AB would now have a share of the lead with two holes to play. Heimberg snagged the tap in birdie on 17 to go into the final hole still tied and both fighting for the win. AB with the box stuck the island first. Seeing that, Calvin sawed off his drive and ended OB left, carding a bogey to end his round. Ezra Aderhold jumped up 21 spots on day two after a 10 under round to put himself on the chase card. He started off hot again securing the first three holes for birdie. He would then go on to grab holes five and six, cruised until a bad drive on eight, and a missed C2 putt resulted in his first bogey of the round. Ezra tried getting it back with a birdie on 9, but would find more trouble on hole 10 for his second bogey of the day. That would be the last danger he'd find himself in, though. Ending the round with 4 more birdies, finishing 100% from C1X, and hit 2 putts from outside the circle. If the putter stays hot for Ezra, I could see him excelling at some more open courses later in the season. You know, everyone's favorite ball golf courses. Ben Calloway would be the last person tied at 23 down and in 2nd place. He started off his round 4 down through the front 9, just a few missed C1X putts held him back. The real setback, though, was after a spit out from a near bullseye on hole 11. But AB will still tell you he loves these baskets. He bounced back with three immediate birdies, only to be stopped by another missed birdie opportunity on hole 15. This one, from inside 20 feet, just a bit high and left. A crucial stroke, but continued his good play with a birdie on 16. Too bad he would end with back-to-back -back OBs on 17 and 18. Bogey the last hole, which would be the difference between second and third, as there was no way AB was missing a C1X putt for the win after the run he was on. That's just not a thing that would happen. Prior to the lead card start time, Simon announced he would not be attending the skins match scheduled for Monday at Bud Hill, stating that he needed to rest his back. Not the news you want to hear when he was one of the players on the most stacked lead card seen on the young season. The moment didn't need a showman, but Simon will always be Simon. The front half of his round could not have been more dull, finishing even through those nine holes. Was in scoring position often with difficult C2 putts in the win that just were not going in. After parring the first three holes, he bogeys four while Vinny went three down in that span, which all accumulated to what might have been the worst decision of the day, electing to go sky heiser on his approach of hole six. That got held up in the strong wind, to no one's surprise, and pushed back worse than Maple Hill's new triple mando, and landed less than 100 feet in front of Simon, which forced him to react to cameras as his caddy Joey Tremali and the rest of the spectators couldn't hold in their laughter. But it might have just been what was needed to loosen Simon up, however, because he birdied the very next hole and had a back half that salvaged the round. He'd birdie seven out of the back nine and despite a bogey, ended the day with a six under round, finished the tournament 22 under and wrapped up a solo fifth place finish. Albert Tom, who kind of looks like a long lost Skarsgård brother, had a great weekend of his own that for most will go unnoticed. Notched only three bogeys over the three rounds and played clean on the final day for a five under round with all those chase card cameras on. The solo sixth place is the best finish for Albert since 2022 and you only have to look at the putting green to realize why. He finished top five in strokes gained putting over the weekend, which hopefully is a sign for the future, as his putting game has been a struggle for some time now. In seventh place, you had Thunder Buddies Gannon Burr and Gavin Babcock, and also another top 10 finish for Chris Dickerson, his third in that many tournaments. Dickerson shot an eight under on the day and climbed up six spots, and that was with what he might consider a poor putting performance over the entire weekend. He's playing solid heading into his home state event where he's coming off a third place and a win in the last two years. 
Gavin Babcock, after two bogeys on the front half, was even for the round heading towards the back. Shot seven under on the final nine holes with an eagle and a bogey. And despite the biggest names in the sport ahead of him, led the field in the park stat over the entire weekend. With how competitive Gannon is, seeing A.B. win his third on the season on the very same day his top five finish streak comes to an end just might be the start of his villain arc storyline for the remainder of the season. His six under final round was made worse with his putting performance over the weekend, missing six C1 putts over the entire tournament. I certainly would not be surprised with a get-back tournament next week at Music City, where he podium last year. With the way he finished this week, he will for sure be on the grind prior to the start of the event. Mason Ford gets back-to-back top 10 finishes and his third so far this season. He would play clean up until hole 9, where he would find some trouble, that being Hazard. Was there even something over there, or am I missing something? Mason would take a double bogey, but come back on the rest of the back half securing four birdies to finish his round at 6-under. I say this every time I talk about the mint slinger, but here we go. If he could connect on more of his putts, he would give himself a way better chance at a top finish. Although with the season he's been having, I think he's performing better than the expectations. Isaac Robinson rounded out the top 10 with his worst round of the tournament at even par. It seemed like nothing could get going for him as he started off throwing OB off his first drive and it didn't get much better from there. Finished the front 9-2 over, but at least he smacked a 70-footer on hole 9. Too bad it was just after an OB drive. Ended his round with 3 birdies and another bogey on 17. We're just going to look on the bright side of the situation and congratulate Isaac on his top 10 finish. Now for some weekend quick hitters. Wade inside's proving it's not luck going back-to-back falling up his ace yesterday with another on the same hole today. Adam Hammett's jumped up 40 spots partly due to this thumber eagle on 14. Gannon Burr admits he might putt a bit hard, but veteran baskets do indeed suck. Might want to watch your mouth before you catch another lawsuit. Ezra Aderhold chimed in only to agree with the Lego enthusiast. Kyle Klein shares that his putt has never felt worse. This means he'll for sure top 10 at MCO. Might want to write that one down. Cat Merch is already out at Nashville manifesting. Not sure what that means, but I'm slightly scared. Chandler Kramer celebrates the small victories, this time not going over par for any of his rounds. People want to talk shit about the trophy, but every player gets a cup with their name on it, and that's for sure better. Ezra Robinson picks up his son Braden's sides from school and even surprises him with some of his favorite snacks. One day we'll talk about this salt and vinegar lays problem, but that's for another time. Fans and even Big Germ are questioning why Nico is in the West Side commercial. You guys must have forgotten they don't have a whole lot of previous winners. Foundation Disc Golf opens up a new storefront in Lynchburg. I wonder if, like their tweets, the design was copied from somewhere else. And that's everything you need to know from the Jonesboro Open and all the other things disc golf from over the weekend. Make sure to not miss out on anything pro disc golf by following along at the Disc Golf World. If you enjoyed, make sure to drop a like and subscribe. It's the easiest way to support the boys while we're on the road. Shout out to all the Patreon members for supporting us. We're 100% funded by the fans and we appreciate each and every one of you disgenerates. Oh yeah, and if you want to see what keeps holding disc golf back, check out the video right here.